Hello, everybody, and thank you for having us. Uh, we are delighted to be here. Um, today, the focus of our discussion is basically uh, data-related issues in cloud contracts, such as uh, software as a service agreements, platform as a service, uh, infrastructure as a service agreement. So these are cloud agreements, and data being the core component of the cloud, uh, there are a lot of data-related issues that permeate throughout the contract. So um, with Jeff and I, you know, being cloud lawyers and, and spending a lot of time uh, structuring, drafting, and negotiating these agreements, uh, we would like to focus this brief session on some of the key issues that we encounter um, and share our insights and also uh, best practices on contractual controls that we implement in our contracts. So that's, that's what this is about. Here is a quick uh, rundown of the agenda. Basically, we'll start with a quick overview of the cloud, and then we'll launch into some of the specific cloud-related issues, such as you know, data ownership, uh, the access and use of data in the cloud, data location, uh, data security, liability allocation, and also you know, what happens to your data should your vendor go bankrupt. So these are the key issues that we plan to cover. Um, we have more slides than we have time, but we have included the slides as a reference material, so we will be skipping over some, but they are in your materials just, just for reference. And I also want to say that neither Jeff nor I are privacy lawyers, so we will not be covering privacy legal compliance issues relative to data in, in this presentation. I mean, we work very closely with our privacy colleagues, you know, whenever regulated data or personal data is involved in the cloud, but uh, given the, the length of the session today, we will uh, only focus on the data-related issues from commercial contracting standpoint. Okay, so with that, Jeff. Thank you, Sonia. Um, so when you think about the cloud and, and what the cloud is, I find it's helpful to think about it in contrast to more traditional um, software licensing and how, it, how that differs. So in traditional software licensing, you have software and stored on premise, you know, on your own servers. Um, so it's really in your own environment, it's underneath your control. Whereas in a cloud environment, you're essentially outsourcing that to the cloud provider. Um, and it'll be hosted by the vendor in their own environment. Um, we'll get into a little bit about whether that's a private environment, a public environment, or some sort of combination of the two. Um, so as, as you move from your own on-premise solution where you have control over that infrastructure, you're, you're relinquishing all those controls to the cloud provider. Um, so your focus will then become more focused on, you know, how much is the service available to you as well as data security because that's now outside of your hands. That's something that you're trusting the cloud provider uh, to provide for you. Um, of course, similar to traditional software, uh, you're still going to want to pay attention to your other contractual controls, such as you know, indemnities, the intellectual property rights, your limitations of liability, as well as warranties. So as I mentioned, there's really three different categories of the cloud. You have your public cloud. Um, that's a multi-tenant environment, so there'll be you know, many customers on it. It's, it's massive scale. Um, but you can also get a private cloud where that's just, you know, a, a single tenant. Um, it's, it's, it gives you a little bit more of control over how that environment is structured. Um, and then you can have a hybrid crowd, cloud, which combines the, the first two um, models. And we've seen these uh, really become more dominant. You know, 10 years ago, the, the cloud wasn't as popular. It was more of something that, you know, smaller businesses would do. But as we all know, the cloud has become an increasingly popular option. There's a lot of cost benefits. Uh, it can be used across a variety of different applications. Um, so now you're seeing more and more companies outsource all of their data um, and their key operations to these cloud providers. Um, and they really have the expertise on uh, controlling that data so that you don't have to do all of that in-house and it frees up your other resources to focus on your core business. Uh, the different cloud delivery models, which I think we're all a bit familiar with. Uh, you have software as a service. 
Um, that's really when you're using the service provider's application. They've, they've designed everything about it. It rests on their infrastructure. Um, I think we're pretty familiar with apps and how they work. Uh, in addition to that, you have platform as a service, and that gives you a little bit more uh, customization to design your own applications that are, then can sit on top of the service provider's infrastructure. Um, and then you have infrastructure as a service, and really that allows you to run and deploy your own code, um, including you know, operating systems, and that, that will allow you to scale a lot more infrastructure into a cloud provider's environment. So when it comes to data, there is a lot of hypersensitivity on both sides of the table, be it the customer or the vendor. From a customer's perspective, the customer wants to make sure that the data is protected, it is only accessed on an as-needed basis by the people who actually really need to access it, and uh, there is uh, strict liability uh, on the vendor's part should any bad thing happen to the data. So that's the customer's perspective. But on the other hand, the vendor's perspective is that the vendor worries about excessive restrictions on its use of the data and also strict liability for data breach, even if the vendor's implementing its security policies. So there is a lot of hypersensitivity on both sides, and the key to negotiating a successful cloud contract is to be able to balance the interests relative to the risk in the transaction. Um, and, and how we do that is uh, we do that by asking a lot of questions, gating questions at the outset of the transaction. And some of those questions are here on the screen. You know, what type of data is being uploaded or generated in the cloud? This is key to determining, you know, what is the data risk profile and what kind of contractual controls and restrictions you would need to put in place. Who owns the data? Uh, who can access and use, as we were talking about, where is your data stored? I mean, this is an important point, and we'll discuss uh, data location a little bit later, but it's really important to know where your data is, particularly if your data is sensitive data or critical data. And then other things to ask about and know within the cloud solution is, you know, where will the data be transferred to or accessed from? You know, are any vendors, personnel from offshore locations going to be accessing the data or providing the services from off offshore locations where they need to access the data? So that's really important. Is the vendor solution <clears throat> compliant with applicable laws and regulations? So for example, HIPAA and GLBA and so many other regulations require certain level of security um, be uh, Im imposed on the data, the regulated data. So to make sure that the vendor's solution is compliant with those requirements becomes really important. But you can do that only if and when you have a good idea of what the kind of data that is involved. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> The other things to think about obviously are, you know, how are you going to allocate liability between the parties? And uh, more specifically, what happens to your data should your vendor shut off the lights, turn off the lights? So we will talk about these issues as we go along. But as I mentioned, I think one of the key things to be able to negotiate a successful cloud contract is to be able to determine what the data risk profile is at the outset. So how sensitive is the data? Now you might be using a cloud solution where the data is just routine business data or operational data, which you don't as much care about compared to the other end of the spectrum, which is regulated data or very strategic workloads that are being uploaded to the cloud or personal um, information, et cetera. So there's a broad spectrum of the types of data. You know, on the one end is just routine, non-sensitive. On the other end is highly critical, sensitive. You've really got to figure out what kind of data is involved at the outset so that then you can actually devise the contractual controls and the solution accordingly. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, I mean, there are uh, the, the type of cloud solution matters, right? Uh, when you're thinking about, you know, what contractual controls to put in place. Um, and also the computing model, which is uh, matters, which is whether it's a private cloud or a public cloud or a hybrid. So for example, uh, in a public cloud, it's one to many. I mean, it, the, the security 
um, measures that are implemented by the vendor are across its solution and uh, customers can't really cherry pick the security measures and impose their own because this is a one-to-many model. So if you have a one-to-many model where you're using a public cloud, is your data that you're going to be uploaded, you know, commensurate with the kind of security that you would be getting. So that's the analysis that really needs to be um, done at the front end and and uh, the risk profile determined. So let's go to the, with that uh, general kind of overview, let's take a look at some of the specific data-related issues that we encounter. So one is data ownership. I think this is a very important issue because owning data basically allows you to exercise control over data. So a party that owns the data is able to exercise control over, data, over that data. And you're able to impose your own policies on that data with respect to the use and access to data. Um, so that, and there are other, other measures and other controls that permeate throughout the contract that sort of derive from ownership. So I think ownership is really, really key. And we'll talk about this point later as well, that ownership is also key from point of view of vendor bankruptcy. So uh, we'll talk about that point, but so ownership is really important. Now with respect to ownership, generally speaking, um, the, the, um, Allocation of ownership rights typically captured in the definition of customer data in the cloud. That's where you would look at, you know, how's the customer data defined? Because that definition then runs throughout the contract in terms of, you know, ownership, liability, access, use. So it's really critical to focus on the definition of customer data. Uh, and sometimes it's broadly defined, sometimes it's uh, narrowly defined, most likely than not in vendor contracts, we see customer data to be very narrowly defined to just inputs that are uploaded to the contract. So the inputs, the information that the customer provides to the cloud solution, that is defined as customer data. But that can be very limiting because there is a whole lot of data that is generated in the cloud as the customer uses the service. And that data that is gen generated in the cloud or processed in the cloud may be, sen may be sensitive, may be derived from customers' regulated data, may be you know, critical information in other regards. So what happens to that bucket of data, right? The outputs, as we call them. So it's really important to address the outputs as well. And in the next slide, typically the customer data definition sort of touches on these types of data or the buckets of data. The first one is inputs. And there is no controversy or, you know, there is no discussion much about who owns the inputs. Of course, everybody agrees that the customer owns the inputs. But the gaps arise with respect to outputs, which are the next two buckets. You know, who owns the outputs? And if it's the vendor who owns the outputs, then they have the right to use the outputs the way they want during the contract and post-termination uh, without any restrictions in the contract. So this is a really important point to keep in mind. Just to recap here, um, cust uh, on this slide, I mean, I've already talked about the customer is obviously interested in you know, a broader definition and the vendor in a narrower definition. But here are a couple of samples of customer data definition at the bottom right. And this is for reference, but I'll go on to the next. So given the importance of data ownership on how you are able to control the data, I think these are some best practices to take away. It's really important to define and understand up front what types of data are going to be inputs and outputs. And, and maybe even think about defining separate buckets of customer data and applying different liability and obligations to separate buckets of customer data. And by that, what I mean is, for example, you might want to define personal data separately from the routine customer data and have the, pers uh, the personal data be subject to a DPA, uh, a data processing agreement. So that's the thought here, that think about that depending on the cloud solution, obviously, and your use of it. Um, and then, of course, it's, once you've defined the data, it's really important to define the use rights, which is what Jeff will get into.
So when you're talking about you know, access to data, the use of data, as Sonia mentioned, you really have to know what data is at play. Um, so defining those buckets clearly will really help you define the boundaries around how that data is going to be used. Um, so obviously, when it comes to inputs, your own data that you're putting in for a customer, you're going to want to retain a lot of control about that. But when it comes to those outputs, what can your service provider, what can your cloud vendor do with that data or not do with that data? Um, so make sure that you're clear about what type of data is involved, who owns that data, and then you can explicitly put the correct controls around it and the appropriate license grant to use the data. Um, and those, those license grants should be clear. So, you know, can the cloud provider use it to develop other products? Can they integrate it with their other products? Um, or is it, you know, a more limited scope where it's just, you know, for their own internal purposes? So all these are conversations that will need to occur that uh, depend largely on the type of data involved and whether it's sensitive to your company or not. Um, of course, if you do provide a cloud vendor with any access to any level of data, um, even if it's you know, aggregated and anonymized, you're going to want to make sure that you have the appropriate remedies in place so that you know, if that scope of use is exceeded, um, they'll you know, stop using it immediately, they'll return the data to you, or you know, if it's some sort of egregious issue and there, there's trust lost, you can terminate the agreement and end your relationship with that vendor. Um, another important aspect of retaining control of your data is to make sure that you know who all the parties are that have access to your data. Um, so a lot of times a, a service provider is going to use subcontractors or other parties um, in the course of their business, and you're going to want to know who those folks are. Um, and Sometimes, it, depending on the data that's involved, you may even want to explicitly have an approval right for those subcontractors. Um, if it's very sensitive data, if there's you know, health data involved or very proprietary information or personal information, um, there may be specific terms that you need to flow down to those subcontractors. Um, obviously, confidentiality is, is one that's very common, um, so you'll have um, you know, those confidentiality obligations that are just as stringent as the ones that you've agreed to with, with your own provider, but there may be additional flow down terms that you need to include depending on uh, the data that you're providing. If you're providing access to anything sensitive, you're going to want to have use restrictions on that. You don't want them, you know, reverse engineering anything sensitive or, or using your data um, for competing products or, or anything of that nature. Um, and as we mentioned, we, we won't get into the privacy aspect, but if there is personal information involved, you're likely going to need a data processing agreement to define exactly how that data is used and processed. Um, and as we'll, we'll talk about next, destruction of data um, is a very important topic as well, as well as your access. Um, so once you hand over that control into a cloud environment, it's, it's no longer um, on your systems, it's, it's in their systems. Um, and you should retain the ability to access that data at really any time. Um, that is your, your bread and butter. You don't want a service provider holding your data hostage. Um, so you know that includes even if you're behind on payments or something like that, you don't want them to be able to shut off your access to your data because that could have significant impacts on the business. But more so, um, just from a data protection perspective, you're going to want to require your vendors to return or destroy your data just to make sure that it doesn't get into the, the wrong hands. And that can occur at any time during the term, um, if, if you request so, uh, for whatever reason. Um, but certainly, upon termination, um, you're, you're going to want to make sure that that data is either returned or destroyed. Sometimes, uh, especially in a, in a public cloud type environment, it may be difficult for a service provider to return the data um, just because it's kind of intermingled within their systems, uh, but they can at least destroy it and certify in writing that they've done so. Uh, of course, there, there are circumstances where a limited amount of data may need to be retained by the vendor. Um, and that's not uncommon for archival purposes or legal compliance issues, and, and that's generally acceptable. However, you're going to want to make sure that they're continuing to handle that data with the same security requirements and care um, and confidentiality obligations that you've had under the agreement. 
Uh, and as, as far as you know, data retention, um, a lot of times, you know, especially depending on, on the type of data involved and, and the volume of that data, at the end of the contract, your own internal team may need a suitable amount of time in order to go in there and get it. Uh, so make sure that they're at least retaining it. You know, maybe it's it's two weeks or 30 days, uh, so that you have enough time to go in and retrieve the data that you need before it is permanently destroyed. Because once it's destroyed, you are not getting it back. Uh, we, we spoke a little about aggregated data, um, and as, as Sonia mentioned, whenever you use the services, there's a lot of other data that's generated, and a lot of times that'll fall into this bucket where a vendor will say, hey, um, you know, this data has nothing to do with you, it's, it's anonymized, it's aggregated, uh, but you want to be careful with that uh, because the, the reality is, is not always all data can be truly anonymized and truly aggregated. Um, so even use of that data carries some risk that it could eventually be traced back to you. Um, for example, if you know, you're a large um, you know, airline in the Atlanta area um, and they have data about a, you know, a number of flights or baggage that goes missing and they, they publish that in some sort of other product, that may be able to be traced back. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure if they are using data for any other purpose besides just internal development that there's you know, correct controls in there such as make sure that our data set is only a certain percentage of the full amount of data so that it cannot be basically you know, reverse engineered to figure out who the data actually belongs to. Um, and if you do uh, allow aggregated data to be used, uh, you may look to have an additional indemnity from the vendor in case anything does go wrong with the use of that aggregated data. Um, this is coming up more and more often. A lot of solutions now, vendors kind of base their pricing off of the use of this aggregated data because it's, it's valuable and they can create other products with it and improve their <laughs> services with it. Um, so you'll hear, hear the argument frequently that the use of aggregated data is baked into the cost. So if you want their product um, at the pricing that they've described, then you're gonna need to give them this right to use the aggregated data. Um, so if, if you do decide that that's acceptable, given the data that's involved, just make sure that you have those correct controls in place. Right. And just a thought on that um, with respect to ownership. Increasingly, we are seeing that vendors call for um, their ownership on aggregated data, not just use rights, but also owning that aggregated data. And of course, that can also have a lot of impact on you know whether you get access to that data at the back end or not. So that uh, so ownership is another issue with respect to aggregated. Increasingly, exactly. Um, so the next issue here is data location. Now, this is an important issue, and it's kind of counterintuitive because, you know, one would think, well, you know, putting the data in the, my data in the cloud means I can access the data from anywhere. The location's not important uh, anymore. It's not relevant anymore. Cloud is ubiquitous. Um, so how does the location matter? But it does. It matters greatly. It can matter greatly, depending, again, uh, on the type of data that you really care about, whether that you have uploaded to the cloud. I mean, if it's routine uh, business data that's not sensitive on this end of the spectrum, maybe this is not as much of an issue, but as you move towards the other end of the spectrum with respect to the sensitivity of the data, this can be a huge issue. Um, and um, so it's really important to think about this. And a lot of cloud contracts actually are silent on uh, the location of data, where it is stored or where the backup facilities are. So this is typically silent. Why does it matter? Because it can have both operational and legal implications. The location can have both operational and legal implications. And we'll talk about it in a, in a sec, but when you think about the location of the cloud, location of the data on the cloud, what is that? Because then you start to wonder, okay, you know, the cloud, what is the cloud? Basically, the cloud is a network of servers that are located in a data center that you don't manage. It's not at your place anymore. It's with the vendor. And so these are network of servers in, in data centers. So when you want to know where your data is located, the question is, 
where, which data center will my data be located? Where will it be stored? And where will it, the backups be stored? Where will it be you know, accessed from, transferred to? That's, that's what um, this is about. And so location matters. Now, from operational standpoint, I mean, location really matters. Because what if the location of your data center is, is in a place that is you know, frequented by natural disasters, flooding, earthquakes, and whatnot? Uh, and, and so there are disruptions to the data center servicing and which then uh, in turn disrupts your use of the service and your access to the data. So even if the, uh, the vendor has a disaster recovery plan or a business continuity plan, I think it really makes um, uh, a lot of sense to actually know where your critical data will be stored uh, and where the backups will be stored so that you can get access to those should there be a disruption to the service. There are also issues about if, so if your data is stored in a data center that is offshore, now a lot of times what happens is the pricing is attractive in the cloud solutions, but that includes storing data in data centers offshore because they are more economical. Uh, and from pricing perspective, they are more attractive. So if that's the case, your data is stored offshore, then you probably may not have as much control over that data or who accesses or and uses that data, um, including you know vendors, affiliates, subcontractors, any third parties. And a lot of time, what happens is that when you're contracting with uh, SaaS providers, for example, or platform as a service providers, they themselves have contracts with third party data centers on which their solutions uh, are, are based or reside. So there might be you know, multiple contractors beneath the layer of your contract with your vendor. So you need to think about those multiple you know, subcontracts and other third party contracts within that layer to determine you know, where your data will Will, will be stored and how it will be accessed. So those are some of the, from operational standpoint, those are some of the issues. There are also legal implications of where your data is stored. And um, that is because you know, storing your data in a particular jurisdiction can actually implicate inadvertent compliance and disclosure uh, obligations. I mean, increasingly we are seeing these terms as data sovereignty, data residency, data localization laws. A lot of countries around the world are implementing you know, uh, data protective laws and data localization laws to be able to understand what those laws are. If your data is going to be stored in that particular jurisdiction, you know, what access a government entity could have uh, to your data, should there be some investigation, you know, compelled disclosures, all of those things should be thought about depending on the nature of the data that you will be uploading to the cloud. Again, this may be a non-issue for routine data, but it can become a bigger issue. Uh, one other point that I'd like to note on this one is it, uh, the location of data can also trigger export control and OFAC compliance issues. So for example, if you have you know, highly technical data that is going to be stored outside the US, uh, that might trigger export control you know, violations. Um, you might need to uh, you know, obtain um, approvals, governmental approvals, before you move that data offshore. There, there might also be OFAC related you know, issues that might come up. So for example, if your vendor you know, sets up a data center uh, offshore and has an affiliate that is based in an embargoed country as a subcontractor, if that affiliate is accessing your data, that can trip up OFAC regulation. So, so that's why uh, location becomes really, really important. And here are a few risk mitigation best practices to address the location risk in your contracts. Needless to say, obviously, you know, vendor due diligence is really key upfront to understand their solution and to understand you know, what data centers they will be using, where, are, where is the location of the data center, who will be accessing it, et cetera. And also not just the, the first copy of the data, but also the backups. You know, where are the backups being stored? Because a lot of times, cloud contracts don't really go into that kind of detail. So <clears throat> here are some of the best practices. Um, I think given the time, I'm just going to skip over 
some of these, they are, I've already talked about them actually in my discussion. So, and here are some sample clauses. We've included some sample clauses in the slides just to show you where these kind of uh, issues pop up and uh, how we address them in the contract. All right, so with that, Jeff, you're on. All right, everyone's favorite topic, data security. Um, so maybe you won't always have this luxury, um, just <laughs> given uh, the solution that you're looking for, but oftentimes you at least have some selection um, of who you're gonna trust with all your data. Uh, so it's really important before you even begin negotiations on a contract to at least do your due diligence and learn a little bit more about that vendor. Um, so you should ask for copies of their technical controls and, and you know, make sure that the contract will later require them to actually comply with those um, technical controls. Um, so not all vendors are gonna you know, share exact copies of their security policies but they'll at least let you on site or let your technical team on site to kind of check out what it is they have going on under the hood. Um, so the first thing you'll wanna know is just you know, make sure that they have measures in place to comply with the contractual limitations that you set forth as well as applicable laws. So you know, what is actually preventing them from doing anything to the contrary? Uh, so just basic policies is, is what you're looking for there. Um, if you are providing them with sensitive data, then do they require their, those people who have access to your data to be subject to background checks? Have any been performed? Uh, what do you know about the people who will have access to your data? Uh, because as we all know, often when there is a compromise of data, there's, there's bad actors behind it. Um, when it comes to audit rights, um, are you going to need broad audit rights? Uh, do they have limitations on the types of audits that you're able to conduct? Do you need to go on site? Uh, audit rights are always a, a nice to have, but you know, what are the chances you're actually going to exercise those audit rights? If the answer is never, then maybe you could rely on some certifications instead. Um, you know, does the vendor have written data response plans and data breach procedures? Uh, to, these are very common now, so what steps are they going to take if there is a data incident, uh, which are increasingly common? Uh, and of course, you know, your, your IT team should be reviewing all of these responses. You'll want to make sure that they're compliant with law, uh, find out if they've had any, you know, significant uh, run-ins recently, particularly when it comes to the GDPR in Europe. Um, you know, also there's there's certain states, California, Virginia, uh, that have more robust uh, privacy laws. So you want to make sure that they're at least aware of those and and have a program in place to comply with them. Uh, as I mentioned before, and Sonia mentioned as well, it's often not just the vendor. There's often sub processors who are involved uh, with different aspects of processing your data. So. Who are those folks and um, do they have the appropriate contracts in place with them? And then finally, as, as Sonia was just mentioning, um, you know, data location matters. Um, so if your data is going into a jurisdiction that's subject to the GDPR, for example, or is there a DPA in place with standard contractual clauses? Um, as I mentioned, audits are, are very nice to have if, if you're actually gonna exercise them, um, but there's a lot of industry certifications as well uh, that can at least give you some assurance that the, the vendor is compliant with industry standards. Um, you know, SOC 1s and SOC 2s um, are always very useful, as well as your, your ISO uh, cybersecurity certification. So this, the, if they have these, this will give you at least some level of confidence that they have the correct protocols in place and are, and are handling data with care. Um, obviously, if there's you know certain types of sensitive data, for example, credit card information, if they're processing any credit card information, uh, you'll want to make sure that they're PCI DSS compliant. Um, if there's you know personal health information involved, HIPAA obviously um, applies as well. Uh, when it comes to audits, some vendors are pretty sensitive, uh, understandably, about just letting anyone um, into their environment or you know into their records. Um, so they may push back on you know how often you can complete those audits or how much notice um, is required in order to conduct an audit or how far back the audit can go. And all of these are, are items that can be negotiated uh, during the contract uh, negotiation process um, and you can come to an agreement given the, the specific data that is involved. 
Um, as, as we mentioned, uh, the controls can come in a variety of manners um, within the contract. So those, those usage rights are super important. Make sure that you know how your data is being used and by who. Um, having, you know, robust confidentiality provisions, knowing who their subcontractors, subprocessors are, making sure that those data security protocols are in place, making sure that they have a response plan for security incidents and can respond to those security incidents, that your data is being, you know, backed up and that they'll destroy the data upon termination. Um, I'll, I'll briefly talk about this. I don't think we need to go into too much detail, but you know, from the customer's perspective, they're really going to want to make sure that the, the vendor's doing everything that they can to protect the data, um, and that if anything goes wrong, they essentially have strict liability for any sort of data breach. The vendor, on the other hand, is saying, hey, you know, I'm, I'm providing you one service. I'm not an insurance policy. I should only be responsible for you know, the specific obligations that I have under the contract. Um, so you need to make sure that there are obligations under the contract and that they're complying with those. Uh, typically, you know, your, your first line of defense is going to be making sure that those security programs are in place, uh, make sure that you have those notification requirements if, you know, in addition to just you know, a security breach, but any sort of security incident occurs if there's any sort of improper usage or, or failure of their security protocols. Um, and you know, just, just be aware that there's, there's some, some ways that you can you know, limit the risk to your data. For example, if you only provide um, encrypted data. Um, and also just be aware of the locations where your data resides. Uh, here's just for your, your own reference, we've included a, you know, standard audit provision. This has a tail period of two years. Um, and then here's some, you know, SOC 2 type report certification language. I'll hand it back to Sonia for indemnities. Great. Thank you. So there's not much to say about indemnity. I guess everybody's familiar with the long negotiations, indemnities, and liabilities, liability provisions take in every negotiation. So these are uh, heavily negotiated um, uh, provisions, and there is no standard market approach, I would say, when it comes to indemnity for data-related violations. It really depends from case to case. It depends from the vendor and its threshold, you know, it's, uh, what it's willing to, to agree to, and also, on the other hand, the customer's le uh, leverage in negotiations, you know, what's the spend, you know, what kind of solution is at hand. So all of those factors heavily, heavily influence negotiations of indemnity provisions related to data uh, violations. Generally, what we tend to see, I mean, the range is pretty broad in terms of indemnities. They can be as broad as, you know, indemnities arising from any claims um, you know, from breach of contract terms. I mean, that's very broad indemnity. And a lot of times, it's, you know, it's not agreed to. It's, it's pushed back by the, by the vendors, but uh, typically what we end up seeing and including in our contracts and asking for are these specific triggers for indemnities rather than a very broad general indemnity. And the specific triggers are, you know, the noted here, which, and the main ones are, you know, the, the vendor's compliance with the uh, uh, data security obligations. If there's a breach by vendor of its data security obligations and should there be any, you know, claims arising from that breach, then of course the the, uh, you know, the, uh, that should be covered as an indemnity. Violation of applicable laws, and this includes, you know, privacy laws, data security laws, and whatnot, um, uh, export control, OFAC, everything. So this is violation of applicable laws. Vendors sometimes ask for an indemnity from a customer, from customer of, with respect to customer supplied data. So the, you know, in case the customer supplied data infringes, you know, third-party claims or applicable law, or IP infringement. For example, if the data is personal data that is being collected and the consents are not appropriately had, so a lot of vendors that you know typically seek this kind of indemnity. Then, of course, there are other indemnities tied to gross negligence and willful misconduct relating to data, um, breach of confidentiality obligations, claim by vendors, third parties, you know, data, data and tools. So. And IP infringement, of course, if content is included. So these are the specific indemnity triggers. Now we may get some or all of them, but these are the main ones that we ask for. <laughs>
The other issues to keep in mind with respect to uh, indemnities, obviously, you know, whether it extends to third-party claims or first-party claims only, uh, as well as for first-party claims, um, whether the indemnities are unlimited or should they be subject to some kind of a super cap. And typically, you know, we will see that uh, indemnities relating to vendors' failure to comply with data security obligations, more and more increasingly, we see vendors asking for a super cap for that indemnity. Then another issue is who controls the defense. I mean, pretty, it's pretty standard for the indemnifying party to control the defense, uh, and that's pretty standard. But in certain circumstances, such as you know claims from regulators or from a from a customer's customers, the customer might want to retain the ability um, to control the defense because you know in certain cases you might not want your vendor to take hardline positions with with the regulators or what have you. So that is again something on a case by case analysis that can be thought about. There is um, with that the, obviously the drafting how the indemnity is drafted really matters. It is the enabling clause. So this really, really matters because the enabling clause basically captures who are the indemnified parties. You know, is it just the customer and the vendor? Or is it the customer's affiliates, customers, you know, other third parties, similarly on the vendor side? So it's really important to define the scope of the indemnified parties. And then it is also important to see what kind of indemnity do you want or you want to offer or accept. Is it just a defend and pay indemnity or is it more of a full indemnity, defend, pay, and hold, uh, indemnify and hold harmless? Because the, in the first one, which is defend and pay, there the indemnitor is only obligated to pay for the defense costs and any resulting judgments awarded to a third party and which can leave, uh, leave out a lot of other losses or expenses that may be incurred by the indemnified party. Uh, so it's really uh, important to think about how the indemnity is drafted. Um, this is just a recap. A customer typically wants a full indemnity, also want, you know, wants first party damages and a series of indemnity triggers. But from a vendor's perspective, a, mostly the vendor will be pushing for defend and pay and also a very, very narrow trigger of events. What are some of the common landing spots that we see established market practices here? We see that indemnities are typically limited to third party claims only. Very few times will we see the indemnity being extend, extended to first party claims. So that's somewhat settled. Um, in terms of the triggers for indemnities, typically vendors offer up IP infringement indemnity, but increasingly we are also seeing gross negligence, willful misconduct, breach of confidentiality, and data security obligations are carved out from the breach of confidentiality um, and violation of laws. Now, some of these might be subject to super caps, as we talked about. But again, it's all a matter of what the vendor's you know, acceptable threshold is and what the customer's uh, negotiation leverage is. Some of the practice pointers, just two call outs. One, from the vendor's perspective, if you're reviewing the definition of losses that you can recover as part of the indemnity, make sure that the, the losses definition is, so, is not so broad that it actually uh, includes first party claims through the back door. So that's the vendor call out. And then the customer call out here is from the customer's perspective. I think it's really important to look at the carve outs from the indemnities themselves because a lot of times we see carve outs, very broad carve outs from indemnities that the indemnity is not applicable to, you know, here are the carve outs. And the carve out may be, you know, if the indemnity claim is triggered by customers, you know, unclean data or if the customer integrates the solution with another third party. So there can be several carve outs that can actually really defeat the very purpose. All right, limitation of liability. Um, it's important to consider the, the different types of damages, consequential versus direct. Uh, with consequential damages, as, as we all know, it can be a little bit difficult to predict what's going to be considered a consequential damage, especially once you get into the realm of, of data and especially, you know, security incidents that can, you know, have a direct result of all sorts of costs, you know, notification requirements, uh, call centers, things like this. 
Um, so you, you do want to be clear on, on what's a consequential damage versus a direct damage. You can have even, you know, acknowledge direct damages for those types of items um, that, you know, you want to be included because I, I haven't done a scientific study, but I would say it's probably 99.999% of your vendors are going to insist on a damages cap um, and a consequential damages waiver as well. So if you've waived consequential damages and then you're in a jurisdiction where pretty much all your actual damages are, you know, those foreseeable consequential damages, then you may be in trouble because you, you want to make sure that you're actually able to recover. Um, so, you know, consider what, what damages are, are likely to occur, um, if those could be classified as, as consequential damages, and then address that within the contract. Because um, you could inadvertently, without really thinking about it, just, you know, your standard consequential damages waiver that you've agreed to a hundred times when it, when it comes to your data, exclude the ability to really recover anything meaningful. Um, as I mentioned, you know, most, most vendors are going to insist on having a cap on their liability, uh, which makes sense because any uh, <laughs> security incident could likely put a lot of vendors out of business. Um, consider whether that should be an aggregate cap. A, a lot of times you'll do kind of a master framework agreement that has, you know, multiple statements of work or service orders underneath it, uh, whereas a vendor may want to limit that more narrowly to the specific services being provided under a specific statement of work or, you know, a specific work order. Um, but, you know, if you're depending on that vendor for one comprehensive solution, it may make sense that that is an aggregated cap. Uh, and of course, it'll always depend on, on what the actual spend is under the agreement. Um, typically, these damages caps range somewhere from 12 to 18 months. Uh, if you're lucky, you might get a little bit more from the customer perspective. Um, but you know, if you're only spending $10,000 a year, then just tying it to those fees may be wholly insufficient uh, unless you, you have a, an excluded damage. Um, so you know, consider whether you want to include a floor amount, a specific dollar value um, that would you know, kick in if, if, if the spend doesn't arise to an appropriate level. Um, as I mentioned, you know, you can exclude certain things from these liability caps, um, and those can either be totally unlimited or they could be subject to a super cap. And we've really seen the use of super caps, you know, grow in recent years, as Sonia just mentioned, even uh, particular indemnities sometimes now are, are subject to a super cap. Uh, there's not really a market standard for what the amount of a super cap would be. It, it could be two or three times the damages cap. It could be as high as 10 times the regular damages cap. Um, but a lot of times you will have these exclusions to your limitation of liability. Um, breach confidentiality, I think, is you know pretty standard, or violation of laws, gross negligence, and willful misconduct, I think we're familiar with. Um, but you know, you also have data security obligations and data security breaches, and oftentimes those those could be a super cap. Um, a lot of times, confidentiality will be thrown into the same bucket as data security. But think about whether that really makes sense, and you know, if if they are two distinct things, you know, confidentiality can deal with a lot more than just your your data. It could be you know other information that's that's shared in in the course of your relationship with them. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, uh, consider including a definition of an acknowledged direct damages. Um, that, you know, you could include a specific definition for incident-related costs that would pick up those items like call centers or. Um, you know, data remediation. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, a customer wants to maximize the potential for recovery, uh, so they'll want that damages cap to be hiable. Often that'll include not only amounts paid under the agreement so far, but also amounts payable, uh, whereas a vendor is going to want to limit that in, in every way possible. So they'll, you know, make it services uh, specific or, you know, limit it to just the amounts paid in a certain uh, period of time. Uh, a customer obviously wants to capture any loss um, that, that could be suffered by them in an exclusion so that it's not subject to the cap, uh, whereas you know, a vendor's going to want to make sure that all those sort of consequential damages are excluded from the cap. Um, as I mentioned, uh, damages caps are, are often in the 12 to 18 months of, of fees paid or payable area. Uh, super caps are, are more negotiable and, and kind of depend on you know, how much you're paying and, and what type of data is involved and, you know, what's falling underneath the super cap. Uh, here we've included just some more sample clauses for your reference. 
Great. So this is our last topic, and I just want to spend only a couple of minutes on this. So basically, um, in the, uh, given the current market realities, the number of bankruptcy filings has, is going up. Just in the last year, uh, since the last year to this year, uh, the bankruptcy filings are up by almost 18 percent, and we are seeing media reports every day about layoffs, cutbacks, and, and many cloud providers are filing for insolvency and restructuring proceedings. So businesses are actually really feeling the financial distress in the current economy. So what happens if your cloud provider were to file for bankruptcy? What happens to your data? I mean, that's the worst nightmare, right? Um, how can you get access to your data? What, what is the recourse that you can have at that point? Basically, typically what happens is that when the bankruptcy uh, filing is initiated, there is an automatic stay that is imposed on all uh, adverse actions relative to the debtor to be able to preserve the bankruptcy estate for the benefit of the creditors. So, um, yes, so there is an automatic stay. Now, after the bankruptcy filing, if the vendor does not have the resources to keep the lights on, they might simply reject or terminate the contract that they have with you, in which case then the question becomes what happens to the data and whether that data is deemed to be the property of the bankruptcy estate. And if it is deemed to be the property of the bankruptcy estate, guess what? It can be sold off to pay off the debt at the creditors, and which obviously can expose the customer to significant liability and risk if it is sensitive data um, that is involved. So in this case, what can you do? Now, thinking about your recovery at the back end when the vendors turned off their lights is too late, obviously, because being mired in the bankruptcy proce uh, proceedings to be able to access your data and figure out you know, the contract, that is extremely laborious, time-consuming, costly, with unpredictable outcomes. So what do you do? I mean, there are at least a few things that you can do at the front end when you are negotiating with the cloud contract, uh, with the cloud vendor, to make sure that they are viable and any third-party data center providers that they are using, they are viable. So that's really important. And there are a ton of other things that you can do, at least that, that are the main ones are, are uh, noted here on this slide. But this is where ownership of data becomes really, really important. So if you have in your contract, you know, expressly stating that all data whether input, output generated through the use of the cloud services owned by the customer, then you know the chances are that it'll be carved out of the bankruptcy estate, and somehow you know it'll not be part of the sale of the assets to the extent that happens to pay off the creditor. So it's really important to call out the ownership. Um, there are other things also to do, like an express acknowledgement from the the vendor that it'll not be considered bankruptcy estate. Again, that you can put a contract clause to that effect. You can also build in notification requirements from your vendor, uh, periodic notification um, and submission of their financial report so that you have your finger on the vendor's financial pulse uh, to make sure that they are viable and you get advance notice before they go under to be able to kick into action and get your data. Um, and, and that is, so these are the kind of you know, best practices, uh, risk mitigation strategies that we uh, deploy actually in our contracts depending on you know, how sensitive the data is again and what kind of vendor is involved. So this was on that thought, I'm going to stop here.